All right, good afternoon, evening, or whatever time of day it is, wherever you're at. Um, and welcome to Adventures by the Book, where our mission is to connect people and communities through the superpower of books. I'm your host, Susan Macbeth, and I'm really excited to have two superstars in their creative uh, uh, industry. So we have Brent Allen joining us from Chicago, a professional magician. Uh, Brent has been uh, a professional magician for over 33 years, performing full-time for over 18 years. He does magic, he does juggling, he does ventriloquism, stage hypnosis. So I guess we better be careful not to stare at you too much. Um, <laughs> shows like fire eating and sword swallowing. Oh my gosh, I I, I don't know. There's going to be sword swallowing today. I hope not. That kind of creeps me out. But um, we're really excited to have you here today, Brent. Thank you for joining us. And of course, one of our favorites Christina McMorris, who has this new stunning book, The Way We Hide, Ways We Hide. I'm trying to make it without a glare. Um, a wonderful book. And a lot of people in the chat box were talking about um, what a favorite book it is. And we do love it for sure. She's going to be talking about that. So I'm not going to say too much about it. But she also has her last book, which was actually a collaborative effort with Ariel Lawhon and uh, Susan Meisner. And they three were here in San Diego a couple months back and we did a fun um, event. But she, of course, you probably know her as the over million copy seller of Sold on a Monday and so many other books. Um, and not to mention, she's just one of our charming favorite sweet authors. We love having her back every time. Welcome, Christina and Brent. Thank you. Thanks for having us. This is going to be fun. You guys, we have so much fun stuff <laughs> that, that yeah, we so, even thought of last night. Like, hey, you know what else we could do? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So Christina is going to talk for a little bit about her book. And then we're going to do uh, go to Brent uh, for his magic performance. And then for part of his performance, Christina is actually going to read an excerpt from the book while he's performing magic first time ever, which is going to be really exciting. Um, there is one part of Brent's act that's going to be PG-13. It shouldn't be a problem for anybody, but I'm just saying so in case anybody brought their kids to the event and don't want them to see a PG-13 part of the performance. We'll let you know when that part is coming so you can keep an eye out. Uh, then Christina and Brent will have a chat kind of talking about magic principles and terminology and history. You guys can chat anytime. You can um, ask questions in the Q&A box in the, uh, the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. You can also do it in the chat box as well, although it's a little bit more challenging because we have to scroll through your messages. Um, and then once we do our Q&A, Christina has generously offered a fun book prize. Do you want to show it now? Yes. But yes. we're not giving it away till the end of the show because you have to stay to the very end. So what do you have in store for us today, Christina? Yeah. And do they have to buy um, a copy of Ways We Hide from, from Adventures by the Book to enter? I can't remember. Well, that. that's a good question because I think they should, but I know that California lottery laws <laughs> don't don't allow us to do that. But this is what we'll do. Encourage it. We will encourage we it. We will encourage <laughs> it and we'll give you an extra entry into the drawing if you did purchase a book from like Adventures by the Book. Okay. Yeah. And uh Amber has graciously put that uh, uh website address on the uh in the chat box so you can click on that and purchase your copy and we'll send you a copy with a signed book plate and give you an extra entry into the drawing so Love did it. you want to talk about what the prize is so we yes. can keep their them salivating during yes. the show? So that you'll know so if you get a chance yeah and if you want to buy a copy for if you already a lot of i know oh my gosh some of the amazing readers here have already read the book um, so if you think of someone that you want to gift it to, then go ahead and can buy that in this whole hour and you'll get an extra entry. And let me tell you what the prize is. It's so fun. All right. So I have, I've been buying these every time I see them on eBay when they're in great condition and it is, um, you know, like a sealed pack. This is the only pack I have that is not sealed. Um, and what this is, is a bicycle made these World War II commemorative cards that, uh, we're basically um, an ode to the map decks that you find in my story. And so as you all who read the story know, there are cards in the story, um, which explains also the little 
map curl there, the peak that you get, and the hint of that in the back of the book there, you get the cards. Um, and as you know, a magician came up with that named Jasper Mascaline, and we'll talk about him today too. And so made it so that right when you have the cards, many of you know, if you go on my website, you'll see the video where I take a replica and I put it in water and it starts to separate after two minutes and splits apart. And you've got a map on both sides, which is just brilliant. And they would send those to the allied POW camps. Well, the prize is this commemorative deck and you can see inside that all of these cards really look like a map that is hidden inside the card so instead of it really being so behind amazing. the card you get to see it and it is made just to play but you can also put it in a frame and it tells you exactly how to lay them out and you will see an entire map um that is in europe that is in there isn't that cool that's so fun yeah so, there's so that alone i mean not notwithstanding the fact that it's a brilliant book the cards alone are another reason to purchase a copy. Yes. If nothing else, if you're not a reader, you get fun <laughs> cards. Um, and then this, of course, my book clubbers, they know that I've given away quite a few of these because they are just so much fun. And this is an invisible ink pen. You know, people think, oh, it looks like um, looks like a, a flashlight. So I'm not pulling this out, so it'll stay good. But if you push it, the light goes on. It's like a, it's like a flashlight, but the ink is invisible. And then you use the light at the tip, which is like a black light, and you can see it. So super fun. So there's a spy pen that comes with the gift. And the last of all, because I thought we got to throw in something more fun too. Um, you pick any two of my backlist titles, anything except the ways we hide. And I will sign them, personalize them if you want to you or to somebody else, or just sign them. And now you already have some holiday shopping off your list. So anything from like, Sold on a Monday, The Edge of Lost. I've done, I think, events with you for every single one of my books over the years, Sue. Yes. Um, when We Had Wings, which we just talked about, the hardcover that just came out, brand new and shiny. And just look at my website. And I've got like, I think, eight books or something. So you pick two and I will send them to you too. So there you go. There's the big holiday prize. So you have during the show, I know that some of you typed in the chat box that you came to Christina's event in San Diego and purchased the book there. And yes, that does qualify you for an extra entry ticket. But for those of you who weren't there or not in San Diego, don't worry, you can go to our website. Um, again, Amber put the link up. If you do that sometime during the show, we will check those and add your name before we um, before we draw names. So, so anyway. We are excited to get started. So take it away, million, million copy bestseller, <laughs> Christina McMorris about the ways we hide. Thank you. I will never get tired of that intro ever, ever, ever for the rest of my when I'm 80 years old and you're still introing me and I go up with my walker. <laughs> I, will, I will cling to that title because um, it is surreal for sure. So, okay. So the ways we hide right there, right above me too. Um, for those of you who don't know what the story is about, and I know some of you are just so amazing readers that could recite it for me by now. Um, the gist of the story is that, as Brent knows too, uh, is a it is about a female illusionist in 1940. 42, who is the mastermind behind an escape show. And the reason she is so good at escape traces back to a childhood trauma she survived in Michigan, which I know one of at least one of you is from, up in the Upper Peninsula. And that was called the Italian Hall Disaster, which I was stunned I'd never heard about before. And because of her skill set she forms from being obsessed with escape as a result, she becomes obsessed with Houdini, and she becomes very skilled in escapes and, and evade tactics in all different ways, which you'll figure out throughout the story. She is recruited then by MI9, which was British military intelligence, what I call the go-go gadget team of World War II, and that they created escape and evade devices that they would sneak into almost anything you can think of. They would smuggle them into allied POW camps to help them escape and also help downed airmen in occupied territory evade Nazi capture. So some of the really cool stuff that for obvious reasons they work with magicians for um, would be things like, and it, like I said, if you go on my website, you will see videos of me doing the cards, but also these other sorts of gadgets. And here is one example that'll show you. Um, I won't show all of them here right now because we've got so much to do here tonight. But so for example, here is, and I had just taken a part for a school. I went to um, McDaniel High School the other day. They have the Christina McMorris Book Club, which was the coolest thing ever. Love and um, I surprised them in person instead of Zooming with them. And I think some of them might be here tonight or I think they're gonna watch this too. So they'll recognize that I brought this watch. 
and illusionists and in my nine personnel came up with things that were so brilliant about this. I mean, you, t you take off the crown and you pop it open and what you get inside is not a working watch at all, but you get a compass inside that is floating in water. And so now you can try to help get yourself to safety. So brilliant stuff that they created, um, the map deck, like we talked about. And so in my story, my character gets gets very involved with MI9 and then she gets pulled much deeper into the war than she ever expects. And for those who read it, you already know there is a coming of age story in here. Um, there, It is really not just a strictly World War II story. And um, But then there is the fun parts of the writing comes with the the escapes and um, the thrilling aspects and suspense. And, and then there's a love story and a lot of relationships and I'm really proud of it. So that's the ways we hide. Um, I will mention that while I was researching, it covered so many topics. Um, I had no idea about the research I was getting myself into, or I probably would have written another book. So blissful ignorance, it was on my side this time because I dove in and then realized how much research I had ahead of me and it was too late to turn back. Uh, so researching monopoly boards, for example, about how they smuggled, you know, silk maps and, and escape tools inside of a monopoly board, how they'd worked with magicians. So I did a lot of research about uh, magicians, about illusions, about escape. Houdini I read several books about his life, which were fascinating. Also came to learn that Houdini, um, there is strong evidence to point toward the theory that he served as a spy leading up to World War I against the Germans. Now, his father was a Jewish rabbi. He had good reason to spy against the Germans. And the theory is that he would travel all over Europe with trunks in tow, doing his shows. Nobody questions the fact that he's got all these escape devices <laughs> with him, just pretty brilliant, um, and sort of hiding in plain sight. And so what he would do is stop in any major city that he was going to perform in. And the night before the performance, he would do a promotional PR stunt and that he would escape out of their maximum security prison and then invite all of, you know, these journalists and reporters to come and cover it. And ooh, ah, he'd escape out of it. And then it would get really good press. And the next day, everyone would want to come to his show. So it was really smart. Well, as you can imagine, then as he's performing that and also performing in front of every leader all over Europe, you know, everybody wants him to come to their palace and perform. He would then supposedly go back to Scotland Yard and report everything that he learned. So I loved that. When I came across that, I'm like, oh my gosh, this has to go in the story. So those nuggets of history are so fun. That of course worked its way in. The magician that also mentioned is Jasper Mescaline, who I, I talked about. Uh, his father was also an illusionist. So Jasper ended up becoming a British army officer. He served over in Africa and he was the head of the camouflage experimental section. Now, Jasper claimed in um, a book that I read called The War Magician in his uh, biography, essentially, that another author wrote that claimed to have been incredible with the things that he accomplished. Now, later it came out that there's kind of questions about how much of that was true <laughs> because as a stage magician, uh, you know, a stage performer, he was very good at PR, just like Houdini. So you do wonder how much of that really succeeded versus did he really, uh, you know, camouflage an entire convoy in Africa? He claims he did. <laughs> so you wonder about these things, but we do know that he did do things like the map deck, which was brilliant. Um, also know that he, which is in my story as well, and it's in the back of the book, there is a photograph of the farmland then that he took and helped design um, and turned it into an airfield that looked like a disused farm. So they would fly out so many of the night flights out of there throughout the war. It was just outside of London called Tempsford Airfield. And they would fly their spies out and you know SOE and they would drop them into occupied territory. And what's amazing about that is that even people living nearby claimed that they had no idea during the war that it was an airfield that whole time because they did such a good job disguising it. So if the Germans flew over, it would just look like a farm. And so they had all the, the farmhouses and the barns and I thought that was really brilliant. So, oh good, did you find it? There we go. Yes, yeah, so there's the barn that still is there um, that you can go inside and it is like a little museum. And you can see right above that, there is farmland and that is the barn. That's what it looked like during the war. 
the barn is very cool in that you can still go there called Gibraltar Barn and you can visit and you can look it up on YouTube and watch a video. So if you don't want to travel all the way to England to see this yet um, or can't yet, then look at that because they give a little tour of it and you'll see all of the like a plaque and all of the uh, the praising that they've done and tributes to these spies like the SOE, especially the women who risked their lives and many of them did not come back and all flew out of there. And they'd go into that barn and they would get what we call kitted up. So they would put on their parachute packs and make sure that nothing on them would be something that could give them away, like a receipt or a travel stub or anything that would point back to England. So that because that one little piece of paper, that one little receipt, just accidentally looking the wrong way before crossing the street could be an automatic death sentence. So that gives you a little bit of insight there. Um, I had so much fun researching all of the magicians and illusions. And I will say that in the opening of the book, um, the very first chapter is the milk can escape, which was one of Houdini's most famous escapes, as Brent knows. I see the recognition there. And um, what's fun about that is I could find it today now in books explaining exactly how we did it. So as Sue knows, I like to joke that you are going to get your money's worth in chapter one, people. <laughs> you get the ins and outs of how he did it and also about how dangerous it was because it seems pretty straightforward when you read how they did it. You go, oh, that's it? That seems so simple. And yet, um, I also talk about in that chapter when things can go very wrong very quickly um, about a magician, an illusionist named Je that went by Janesta and how his... Um, prop people had been carrying in the milk can to a performance and he had done it many, many times and they accidentally dropped it. Well, they did not realize they had dented it. And so it made it on, he was unable then to open it and in the, in the middle of the show. And so he ended up dying because of this trick. So there really is a lot of danger involved in, in the most the simplest illusions of these escapes, um, including Houdini's brother, who was also a, an amazing illusionist and escape and escapologist. And he also almost died doing this trick at one point. So I thought that was really, really interesting. All right, there's, I gave you a lot in a short period of time because I know we've got a lot to do here. I think I covered all the fun stuff I want to cover talking wise. Um, and then I will mention too, for any book clubs, I know a lot of book club members are here today. If you um, go on my website, there is a book club guide that talks about tricks and fun activities for your clubs. And I will Zoom with any of you if you want. And there's lots of recipes, including one for an invisible ink that is very important in the story. For those who've read it, you know then that it becomes a key element. And it is a really good recipe. <laughs> I tried at least five of them and it was really, really good. So, all right, here we go. Next on our agenda. Well, I'm can, I just, can I just interject one thing? Cause you mentioned book clubs and I wanna really reiterate that because her book is so perfect for book clubs because there's recipes, there's magic tricks, there's history, there's the opportunity to meet with her. There's her book club guide on her website. She's also a Novel Network member. So you can go to novelnetwork.com, schedule a book club visit with her anytime you want. Well, assuming she's available. Um, so it's really a multi-sensorial feast for you to schedule her for your book club. And that could include libraries too and social groups. So don't, you know, it's not just limited to book clubs. So thank you for that, Christina. So take it away, um, introducing Brent then. Uh, absolutely. So, okay, here we go. So next up on the agenda, because by the way, I need to also mention, this is really important, how Brent and I know each other is because Brent was, he has been a professional magician, obviously, as she said, for so long. And he was so kind to read my book, the, all the parts that had to do with magic and illusions and escapes and make sure that I didn't just screw up royally <laughs> and make sure that he flagged it for any errors. And oh, I'm so grateful to him. So when he gave me the thumbs up, I'm like, Phew. okay, good. Yeah, I was impressed. You, uh, you clearly did your homework. I think there was just one thing that I said, I'm not sure if that was exactly, you know, you might want to, but other than that, I mean, 95% of what was, you had in there was, was spot on. Thank you so much. I remember, and it was about an axe use, and um, and I tweaked it just enough that because I I knew my facts from history, but I also knew how when you you brought to my attention, it could read wrong, and I'm like, you're absolutely right. So yes, so that was fun. All right, ready, people. I'm doing my one card trick <laughs> because I'm not going to follow Brent. <laughs> That's what I've established. <laughs> my one card trick I've known since high school. <laughs> this is 
This is it, people. All right, here we go. Are we ready for this? This is going to be so thrilling. And the suspense, uh, if you are in suspense to see if this works, then trust me, so am I. <laughs> okay, people. All right, we're going to do this. Okay, here we go. So I am not going to look. I'm going to let you guys. Okay, how do we do this? Okay, okay, we're going to go like this. Um, okay, here, how do we do this? Okay, Brent's better at this than I am. All right, so I'm going to do this. And you tell me where to stop. Do you want to do, Sue? Do you want to do this? Sure. You want to stop, and I'm good. That'll be your card. Okay, ready? Stop. Okay. So they're not marked or anything. Trust me, they have, <laughs> there's nothing to help me here. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to close it up and I'm just going to show you guys. And I'm not looking. Can you see it? Yep. Okay, everybody memorize it. Everybody memorize it. All right. <laughs> Don't judge. Don't judge. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But on top, only because I'm now going to shuffle. All right. Are you thinking of the card? Okay. Listen, so Maria Lou's got the drum roll going. Thank you, Maria. Okay, here we go. All shuffled. You ready? Okay, here we go. All right. Okay. Now, think about the card. Think hard. <laughs> All right, here we go. All right, send it to me telepathically through Zoom. All right, no. I hope we're getting close. Otherwise, are we still just just supposed mail. to tell you when you pass it? No, I don't think so. I think I'm supposed to figure it out myself. Okay. <gasps> See, Yay. I had a trick and it worked. <laughs> <laughs> that's it, guys. That's it. Show's over. That's it. All right. Yay, that's awesome. <laughs> okay. Next up, I am going to read. This is where we have not practiced this. So we'll see how this goes. <laughs> but I love this. This is going to be so fun. Okay. This is recorded in perpetuity on YouTube. So <laughs> no pressure. Yes. Yeah, so I'm really glad the last thing worked. All right. So we thought last time, like, how fun is this that there is a part of the story? That, um, so that those who've read it will remember most likely that at one point, Fena, my character, is in an orphanage and she becomes very good friends with a little girl named Poppy. So at this point, she is trying to do magic for Poppy to entertain her. And I thought, how fun would it be if Brent did the things that, I, that she does in the story? So we'll see how this goes. All right. Okay. All right. So you get like a visual. This will be like what the movie is like, people, when it becomes a movie. Okay. All right. I sat up and made space on my cot as Poppy crept over. Cross-legged, she set aside the train and delivered the wooden button that was just rough enough for a nice grip. Now we're gonna do a coin today. And the tr little train is like this, okay. Her brows dipped in anticipation as I baited her gaze to follow the disc in a slow zigzag between us. I appeared to place it in my left hand, made a fist and poof, palms splayed, the button was gone. <laughs> so fun. Her mouth formed a small O, which tripled in size when the button reappeared in my right hand. And a squeak escaped her throat. Do it again, she urged in a hushed voice. And it dawned on me that she was my very first real audience. To prevent my debut from being the shortest in history, I obliged by repeating the zigzag, through, though deviated slightly from the French drop, drop to vanish the button from both hands. Nice. Upon pulling it from her ear, she silent clapped only to plead for more. Alternating my methods to throw her off. Sleeving. You do that. <laughs> Palming. There we go. Lapping. I don't know if we can do lapping. <laughs> we'll imagine. I made the button emerge from her hair, then chin, <laughs> and out of thin air. My skills were rusty, but the low light was forgiving. When the button fell from her nose, she covered her mouth to contain her giggles. I was contemplating another variation when she asked, will you teach me? Please, please, will you? She was effusive with hope, practically vibrating. Giving away my secrets, granted not my secrets exactly, wouldn't have been my first indicate inclination, but feeling a tingling in my chest, a sense of thawing, I agreed. That, how fun was that? <laughs> that was great, yes. Exclusive people, exclusive. <laughs> I know, Sharon was so excited. She said that there should be a t-shirt saying that we were in attendance at this event. <laughs> I agree. So fun. All right. 
Are we ready, people? This is who you really came for. This is why I'm the opening act. <laughs> I'm going to pass it off to Brent now. Okay, well, thank you so much. I don't know how I can, I mean, that was a pretty amazing card trick. And you're the the million plus bookseller. So I, I can't, I can't compete with that. So I'm just going to try to entertain some people. So now this is a little interesting for me because I'm trying to, I'm trying to perform in, in this box here. So what I do want to tell everybody is everything you're going to see here, I promise I'm not using any camera tricks or anything like that. I wanted this to be as close as it could to if you were actually here. Uh, one of the things that I'm planning to close the show with is as close to I've ever come to real magic. And so I needed to make sure you knew that there were no camera tricks with that. So now it's interesting. I enjoy the one thing I do enjoy about performing for a camera, uh, doing a virtual show is obviously <clears throat> people are aware that a few years ago, things went a little wrong in the world and social gatherings weren't really allowed. Now that's changed and life has mostly gone on. But today I went to get a physical and I walked in and first thing out of the receptionist's mouth was, you need a mask, which it's been a little while since I was required to wear a mask somebody. Now, this is where I'm glad that I'm a magician because as a magician, you know, magic is fun for entertaining and such, but the important thing is magic needs to be practical. Magic really should help me with my life. So when she told me I needed a mask, I just kind of reached out into the air and, 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 <laughs> uh, <laughs> I love it. oh my gosh wow. and so then i was able to to get that taken care of now fortunately i don't need this today so that's great now magic is one of those things now mostly in your book christina it's all about sleight of hand but uh there's a chicago magician uh who died several years ago by the name of eugene Berger. it's very big in the magic community and he is credited as saying the house of magic has many rooms. There's many different types of magic from the grand illusion with large boxes making tired tigers appear to mental magic, to card magic and coin magic and close-up magic to uh, other things. So I wanted to throw something in a little bit that I'm very proud of and I've used it as a warm up to a lot of my shows for many, many years. And uh, I just wanna show you all there's, this is just a, a square grid. And this is going to be, you see, magic, there's a difference between magic and illusion. There are things that we find magical in life. And there are things that are illusions. They're fooling us. Sometimes those overlap, which is usually what you see in a magic show. It's the illusion, hopefully, is entertaining and magical to us. What I'm going to do right now is hopefully you will find magical, but it's not an illusion. What it looks like I'm doing is actually what I'm doing. So I wanted to start by asking somebody if somebody would just, uh, I need somebody to type in a single digit number in, in the chat. Okay, <laughs> Michelle Habrick was the first yes. one. He gave me a four. Now I, I'm gonna go with my second one that was Marilyn with a seven. So we've got uh, my dry erase marker here. We've got 47. I hope you guys are seeing it. It's reversed for me. I don't know, is that reversed for you or can you no, see it okay? Good. It's good. Okay. So now what I'm going to do really quick, give me a couple seconds. Um, I would play the Jeopardy song or something, but I, it's a very low budget thing. So uh, let's see. <laughs> na, 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 na. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. And normally when I would do this in my stage shows, I would actually have the Jeopardy music playing, but. Um... We'll, we'll pretend. Oh yeah, we could have queued that up, I guess. Huh? Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> I, I didn't warn you about that, so. Uh, I haven't watched it since Alex Trebek left us. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. So now here I have here a bunch of numbers. And you'll notice none of those numbers are 47. But actually, in reality, all of those numbers are 47. Allow me to demonstrate. So we've got 11 plus 8 is 19, plus 26 is uh, 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 
45 plus 2 is 47. 27 plus 1 is 28, plus 12 is 40, plus 7, that's 47. 4 plus 28 is 32, plus 6 is uh, 38, plus 9 is 47. 5 plus 10 is 15, plus 3 is 18, plus 29, that's 47. Okay, that's, you know, just that's pretty straightforward math. But now if we look at 11 plus 27 is 38, plus 4 is 42, plus 5 is 47, 8 plus 1 is 9, plus 28 is 37, plus 10 is 47, 26 plus 12 is 38, plus 6 is uh, uh, 44, plus 3 is 47, 2 plus 7 is 9, plus 9 is 18, plus 29 is 47. Oh my gosh, wow. But wait, there's more. Because you see, diagonally, 11 plus 1 is uh, 12, plus 6 is 18, plus 29 is 47, 2 plus 12 is 14, plus 28 is 42, plus 5 is 47. Now, if we do these four here, 11 plus 8 is 19, plus oh. 1 is 20, plus 27 is 47, 26 plus 2 is 28, plus 12 is 40, plus 7 is 47, 4 plus 28 is 32, plus 10 is 42, <laughs> plus 5 is 47, 6 plus 9 is 15, plus 29 is 30, uh, sorry, 44 plus 3 is 47. The 4 in the middle, 1 plus 12 is 13. Uh, it's a 12 plus 28 is 40. Plus 1 is 41. Plus 6 is 47. The four corners, 11 plus 2 is 13. Plus 5 is 18. Plus 29 is 47. Wow. Now I'm warmed up. <laughs> Somebody just said my face. <laughs> I'm like frozen. I didn't really freeze. I was. <laughs> oh, what? Oh, they're clapping loudly. Like, I don't be like, how? Amber's like, how? That so, is so cool. As I mentioned, you know, I hope you found that a bit magical, but there was no illusion to it. There's what you saw was actually what I did there. So, but now, uh, you know, I make my living, I do a lot of festivals. And the interesting thing is when I'm at festivals at the end of the, I, the festivals pay me a daily rate, but it's more like street performing. It's I get a show together and then at the end, I pass the hat for tips. And a lot of times, because a lot of these festivals have a very international audience, and sometimes I'll get some unusual foreign money. Several years ago, I got this piece of money, which I had no idea what it was. Uh, in fact, I couldn't, it's not even English in there. I see a five on, on there, but, and there's some letter uh, numbers there, but I can't read what that, what that is. So I didn't know, and I took it to several banks and they couldn't identify it either. I finally took it to a bank and there was a gentleman there. He said, oh, I know what that is. And he, he came up with some kind of, I, I don't even remember what the term was. And I said, what country is that from? He said, uh, it's Uzbekistan. Mm -hmm. And I said, I don't even know where that's at. But um, I said, well, how much is it worth? And he did a, a little search and he's like, well, it's not worth. I mean, that is five. And again, it's, I, I don't know what the, what they call that money he goes but in truth if if you were to cash this in uh-oh did he freeze uh-oh did he freeze the suspense oh no oh my gosh <laughs> should... we need to know what it does and how much it's i know doing. we have an author friend jennifer style who was living in uzbekistan we should, should have been in the audience <laughs> Wow, that's so crazy. All right, oh. I wonder if he knows he's frozen. Uh oh. All right, let me. Let, all right, let me message him and see. All right, people, this is see right now. Now I got it. I wish I had a second trick <laughs> so I could fill in the intermission. So mm, let's see here. Let me. Is he okay? I just sent him a message. See if he uh -huh. is aware that he is frozen. No. Oh, okay. Oh. He's probably going to come back on then. Yeah, okay. I think so. That is good. All right. Yeah. So let's see what else. But while he's doing that, I'm just going to uh, mention again our Superbook event, February 16th in San Diego. Let me ask you this. February, the middle of winter, would you rather be in San Diego or where you're at now? So 20 authors, including Christina McMorris. We have the founding drummer of Maroon 5, Ryan Dusick coming. We have an internationally renowned audiobook narrator, Julia Whalen, who reads for Tara Westover and Kristen Hanna and all the, the big wigs. Um, 20 authors. You're going to spend the whole day with all of them. Um, it's going to be just an amazing event. And um, I, I hope you, you come because it's really fun. And we get told year after year that it's one of the best 
uh, best events, literary events ever. And oh, thanks Amber for reminding me is that we extended early bird pricing until the end of the year so you could do your holiday shopping, give the gift of an experience um, with a book and uh, uh, you can take advantage of early bird pricing but only through the end of the year. Um, so yeah, anything uh, else, Christina, while we're waiting for Brent to come back? Uh, let's see here, I've got, well, as you well know, I'm coming, it's on my website, I wanna say in April, um, maybe mid-April, right? Or yes. 20, 24, something like that, um, that be heading to Coronado and, uh, and then- Corona. Oh, thank you, of course. Corona. April 22nd. That's right, thank you. April 22nd. So Corona, uh, so, so Southern California, you guys, you want to all come to Southern California, don't you? <laughs> and so exactly. we did, um, an event there with Susan Meissner and Ariel Lahan, and we'll be talking about when we had wings and also our, our other solo books. And you'll definitely want to hear about their solo books coming out. They, they sound amazing. So we'll be doing that too. Yeah. yeah. And something we're also working on that's not official yet. So it's not confirmed, but we are looking at launching our new uh, wine and book pairing event up in the Napa region uh, of San Francisco. April, look for April. We're going to do um, an eight author event, book and wine pairing. It's going to be super fun. Uh, Christina and Susan Meisner are coming for one of the weekends. It's, it's going to be amazing. So if you like wine and you like books and really who doesn't, um, keep following us on our website or our social media and, and hear more about that. And now I'm getting concerned about Brent and I, do you have his number that you can text him, Christina? I do not. Isn't that crazy? I should. Um, yeah. he, I had only met for the first time today on, oh, here we go, on Zoom. There he, is. there he is. Okay. We were worried about you. He appeared like a magician. <laughs> he escaped and he came back. <laughs> I, th I think the internet went out at my house. So all of a sudden I was like, oh, wow, Christina is frozen. Oh, wait, everybody's frozen. <laughs> <You're> like, oh, <laughs> yeah. So we are in major suspense about what the value of that currency is. Okay. <laughs> Uzbekistan, Uzbekistan okay. dollars. Okay. So, uh, right. So the Uzbekistan dollar, again, I, I sorry, I, that was all part of the buildup in the suspense. Yes. So yeah, anyway. He told me that really, uh, if I wanted to cash it in at that point, it was only worth about one U.S. dollar. <gasps> and cool. look at that. So fun. Nice. And I deliberately wore a T-shirt today. So you saw that there's no sleeves or anything like that. So, uh, so yeah, now I have a dollar that was formerly from Uzbekistan. So Very cool. That's wonderful. And by the way, it's called Uzbekistan Som. Oh, well, thank you. That's, You're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> I, had, I deliberately left to give you time to Google that. Actually. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah. So now I figure we should discuss, uh, tell people that upcoming is the, uh, the PG-13 part of the show. Of just uh, so, listening. No. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So this is some, yes. Yes. There's nothing, uh, nothing dirty or anything like that. And what you're going to see, I'm just going to be using some jumbo playing cards, but I'm going to be telling a bit of a poem, a love story about romance and love and betrayal. And there's a little bit of innuendo in this. There's nothing blatantly R-rated or adult, but I figured we would uh, give our more sensitive viewers the option to mute this for the, the time being. And then I guess maybe I'll do this when we're, when we're ready to <laughs> let them unmute, so. You know, they're all turning the volume up now. Well, of course, yes. <laughs> like, oh, now it's getting good. <laughs> so um, I will tell you a story of romance and love, beautiful and pure, like the wings of a dove. I shall tell you this tale using cards, rhyme, and wit. It was composed by me, and that is no shock. Told her we'd keep it, we'd keep it PG. Yes, this is a tale of two gals and a guy, a fairy tale of sorts. Now let's find out why. Well, the first two of the three were a husband and wife, a king and his queen for most of their life. He called her Edith and she called him Stan. She was his queen and Stan was her man. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah. Aww. Aww. Now the king, he could smile. But the queen she could not, for it was a child they wanted, but could not be got. 
Oh, the king was potent, virile, well-made. But the queen, she was sterile. You see, she is spayed. <laughs> Gelded, neutered. It's a veterinary Aww. term. <laughs> yes, the king longed a son to carry his name. And soon it was Edith he started to blame. Oh, the fighting, the yelling. Edith could take it no more. She called Stan a bum and his mistress a horrible person. <laughs> That's right. She was a horrible person. Oh, she knew about Kate, all right. A comely young lass with a face like a queen and a firm, shapely ankle. <laughs> nice ankles, huh? <laughs> she's a little clubfoot, but she still dances well, and that's important. <laughs> yes, it was for Kate the king lusted, but he still loved his queen. So they became a threesome, the king in between. The king stand trio, they came to be known. But a king with two queens would be rocking the throne. You see, lust and greed, they don't mix well with fate. And soon it was Edith who lusted for Kate. <laughs> Jerry, Jerry, Jerry. <laughs> so much scandal on your, on your webcast, right? Uh, two queens in love, they sent Stan away. But he quickly returned. He wanted to play. Thanks for noticing. But they returned him again, refused him again, and sent him outside the walls. And should he return, they would cut off his bald head. <laughs> Now, poor King Stan, he wanted to play, so he snuck back in while Kate was away. Ooh, a fight broke out. Edith snarled and hissed, not to mention the king. Boy, was he pretty upset. But the plot thickens because, you see, Kate soon returned to Edith's delight. But what if King Stan, he was nowhere in sight? Two queens in love, so happy, quite gay. Convivial, congenial, happy, friendly, helpful. That's how it's defined in the dictionary. But what if King Stan, it had not been his day. He had lost his kingdom, his queens. He was down on his luck. You might even say he was royally freaking out. <laughs> so what is the lesson that we are to learn from Stan, Kate, and Edith and the tables they've turned? Well, I told it to Stan, and now I'll tell it to you. You can't have your Kate and Edith, too. <laughs> Yay! It's poetry. Very cute. Reminds me of my, my um, late grandfather's limericks that he mm -hmm. had that were PG-13 and bordering on, you know, it's, you always knew when the R-rated ones started coming out when grandma would give the evil eye. And she's like, you better not finish that. <laughs> <laughs> Now, really quick, um, uh, based on when we started, I know we were trying to fit in 20 minutes. I disappeared for a few minutes. Are we looking to end at about 10 till? Uh, yeah. Do you have an, another trick or? I've got just one last one. Okay, I, yeah, I, go I, ahead. I'm going to skip one because it, it's, it was not as great. So I'm going to jump to the big finale. Ooh. Now, years ago, I, I've been working on this for several years and uh to be honest this will be the first time i've ever performed this bit it's something i've been working on for a long time and years ago i heard a, a riddle that kind of sparked this and this riddle was what gets larger the more you take away from it larger the more you take away from it i'm terrible at these yeah a I hole oh okay uh, a hole. Yeah. Yes. You know, a hole is something, but it's actually nothing. Now, you've been seeing me do sleight of hands with something. And so I had the idea of trying to do sleight of hand with nothing. So I'm going to make some holes in this card. And like I said, this is actually the very first time I will have performed this. So I hope it works. <laughs> but I've been working on this for a long time. So now these are real holes. You can, can you see yeah. through that? Yep. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to try to get real close here. And this, and I actually got a pen here. You can kind of see poking through the holes there. I'm going to try to do sleight of hand with nothing. Sleight of hand with a hole, which as we know is not really possible. 
But if I take like, for instance, this hole down here, and move it oh my gosh up there wow if i try to take this one here and bring it down to there that's cool you can still see through the holes and then this last one right like that so now you can actually see the pen poking through all the holes, that sleight of hand with nothing. But as I mentioned earlier, there's a difference between magical and illusion. I mean, I hope you found this magic. It's definitely an illusion because something like moving holes, manipulating nothing, everyone knows that's not possible. Oh my God. <laughs> that was fun. Okay. Um, <laughs> that's amazing. Very cool. And so, well, that was my first real performance of that routine. I hope you enjoyed it. Oh, that's great. Very much. Yay. That was fun. Thank it you, was Brett. Fun. That was, and I, I just want to reiterate that, you know, he does this professionally, but he does this in person. And to translate that onto a little screen, you know, this size is, it, it, it takes a special talent to be able to do that and still translate it. So you did a great job, Brent. Thank you. Thank you. Fantastic. So did you have one more, did you say, or do we have time for that? Is it? A uh, I can, if you've got the time, of course. Okay? No. I think, you know what, we have the time. Sure. Go ahead. Yeah. Everybody here, I, if we all, does everybody here agree? I think we all agree. Okay. All right. <laughs> yeah. You can type in the chat box if yes, yes. There you yes. Go. Okay. Yeah. We got a few yeses there. Yeah. I'm waiting for one person to say, no, boo, get them off. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, they're, they're outvoted. Right. <laughs> so this one is done with two cards, two different colors. Now there's two ways that you can fold a card in half. You could fold it the, the lengthwise, the longwise, and make it, I call that like making it a hot dog. Or you could make it the short way, fold it in half this way, make it like a hamburger. And there's two ways you could take two folded cards like that and put them one inside the other. You could put the hamburger inside the hot dog bun, or you could put the hot dog inside the hamburger bun. So there's two different ways to do that. Now, I'm just gonna leave this like this. Now we folded the two cards, we've seen both sides of each one, but what if we could use this as just kind of like a, a gateway into the past? And so if we travel into the past, we can actually, that's fine. Take that card and put it in outside in again. Or we can we can still go back to the present again. You can see on both sides here. Now the best part of it is since this is kind of acting as the barrier, we could even take it and and go really close to the edge. You can actually see there. Oh, that's cool. But what I love the best about this is if we take it here and we just tear and we, we freeze things in time, now we can see we've actually frozen that card midway. And if we actually look and we open up each side, You can see that those are actually. Oh no! No, <laughs> you can't freeze right now. Oh, okay. oh no. <laughs> so. Oh, that's fun! Wow! Nice. Yay! That's amazing. Yes. Okay, that's all I had for you. <laughs> Thank you, Brent. That was fabulous. So fun. All right. Well, we thought that we. Um, at the end here, just talk a little bit about magic and um, illusions. And I remember some of the interesting things um, and I'd love to hear your take on all of this, Brent. But I remember as I was researching, just as you break down magic and illusions and and um, I watched a bunch of videos from Penn and Teller. <laughs> so that was really helpful. And as they would demonstrate it and break it down and all of the, um, the dynamics of it and, um, 
And, and also with Jasper Mescaline too, talking about what, you know, the things that he found that were the most important. I remember one of the things I put in the story about how the best illusions they would say are sometimes remarkably simple in design. Like you don't overcomplicate it. And sometimes those are the best ones, which I thought was so interesting. And how the three principles then of magic being disguise, simulation, and distraction. And, um, and I, it was just, it was interesting to hear about sort of the academic view of that of breaking it down that way. Um, and also about how I remember when I read, I thought it was really interesting about how they would say that with illusions, the most important thing too, is that you include the audience sort of in your story, like you did kind of, you know, I love that you did the fun one, the poem, but include them in, in the story and that they allowing the audience to finish the story on their own and then and come up to their own presumptions based on their own life experience and then give a twist to it and give a surprise so that you know a person uh, presumes that a book that um, is going to have all the pages inside you know unlike Shawshank Redemption so sorry spoiler alert um with Shawshank Redemption you know you would see the pages on the side you assume then that there's not something cut in the middle of it that there's not it's not empty that um a you know, a heel of a shoe is going to be solid, that it's not going to be hollow in the middle. And, and then using that to the advantage of being able to but give a twist to it that they don't expect. So would love to hear some of your thoughts about, about those and about what drew you to magic in the first place. Okay. Well, I mean, what you said about allowing the audience and, and w w essentially weaponizing their preconceived notions against them. So for instance, a something that a an amateur magician will often do is fan a deck of cards and say, here we have an absolutely normal plain deck of cards, which is calling attention to the fact that, wait, are there not normal plain deck of cards? You know, so as a magician, if I want to show that a deck of cards is normal, I will fan it out. I might show a few of them, but I never say this is a normal deck of cards. I let the audience see that it's a normal deck of cards and 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 go on that assumption. Um, and as far as the, the magic being simple and the best stuff being simple, it's uh, as I'm sure you've heard, you know, everyone says a magician never reveals his secrets. That's not because we want to be, ooh, the keeper of the secrets and ooh, I want to know something you don't. The truth of the matter is, if I were to explain to you how I did, for instance, the, uh, the one with the holes and uh, on the card, if I explained that to you, you'd be like, oh, that's it? Okay. And I, by doing so, I would be stealing the magic from you. Mm -hmm. When I became a magician myself, I, I, I cut out my my wonder organ, I guess to say. Now when I watch magic, I can't enjoy it with that wonder and awe. I can appreciate it from a performing standpoint, but I don't, it's not magic to me anymore. Mm -hmm. And so if the next time you see somebody do magic and you ask them, oh, I've got to know how you do that. What you're really is saying, I want you to steal the magic from me. And yeah. so magicians not revealing their secrets, they're doing you a favor by not doing that. So, Right, I love that. I'm, I'm gonna chime in here really fast and say that I, it reminds me so much of, I remember hearing, I think it was Jerry Seinfeld that was telling a story about how he was sitting with other, I think like Robin Williams or something. I mean, he was sitting with a couple other amazing comedians and they were at someone's show and they said the and they said the comedian that they knew did a great job had a great set and they said they said it was so interesting they said because i think the question was can you enjoy other comedians and jokes and and they said we do but in a very different way because we're analyzing and they said i remember they said we sat there and we went hmm. and they said we didn't laugh you know you go that was funny <laughs> and then i thought oh isn't that interesting yeah um, that's exactly it so yeah. um what got me into magic was uh, uh in high school, one of my best friends, his father was a magician and I saw his father perform and I was blown away. And I said, I need to learn that. And so he taught me a few things. He directed me to some books I should look up and, and I was hooked. And uh, from there, it's just been kind of an obsession ever since, you know, that was my early teen years. So this is, this is close to 35 years ago that I first got bit by the magic bug. And uh, I would put it aside for a while and 
get a real job or whatever and let life happen. But I kept going back to that magic and magic and performing is the one thing in my life that has always drawn me back. I've never gotten bored of it. And so uh, about 18 years ago, I decided, you know what, I just need to make this what my life's work rather than trying to juggle it with everything else. And uh, I've never looked back. Great. I love that. And I love too that um, that shows like America's Got Talent, and so you know has it really brought some of the sleight of hand that you think that how can that really wow an audience when it's such close up magic, and and I thought they've done a really good job of bringing some of that to the forefront. I know that my my youngest son Kieran, who's now you know sixteen going on forty, as I like to say. Um, and Susan knows for sure this is true. Um, so when he was about, I want to say eight years old, he loved, just fell in love with, with sleight of hand and especially card tricks and started performing them for anyone who would watch. <laughs> so when I say anyone, and they were all very entertaining. I was an eight-year-old doing some pretty good card tricks and um, I can't do them, you know, and he, he's, he's just got them down and, and uh, we would go to the post office and I would send off all of my books and it would be a big stack. So I'd be mailing off and he'd be at the next um, counter <laughs> with one of the, um, like the post mistress who we became friends with all of them at one point. And he'd be doing card tricks for her. <laughs> so, He's a natural entertainer. <laughs> he is. He was, I'm like, go entertain everyone while I send off my book. It was great. So I will say to his credit, um, I must plug him here in that he is the one who taught me um, the card tricks that are in my story. So as you know, Brent, you remember there's a scene that is, I won't give away too much for people that haven't read it yet, but there's a very climactic scene then that involves Svenna doing it, uh, basically card tricks for her life, and uh, which she doesn't anticipate. And you'll all see when it becomes a big movie with Spielberg, you'll see it on the big screen too. Um, and so when that scene came up, I knew that that was going to exist. I didn't know what card tricks I would would use. And oh my goodness, how handy is it when you actually give birth to a child that becomes so helpful later? <laughs> I'm always like, no, I'm like, this is why I gave birth to you. You are so helpful. <laughs> Finally, earn your keep. So he, I asked him, I said, I need some card tricks here that are, as, as I know the two of you can understand, especially Brent, how do you break them down in a way that is in layman's terms um, that is not over, doesn't sound complicated and doesn't sound too technical, you know, because a whole card trick, right, could take up five paragraphs to describe it. And yet that is not the story. So you're kind of like, okay, how do you describe magic to this visual um, in words? It's kind of like describing art. And I thought, oh, wow, or describing music. And I've done that in one of my books before too, of breaking down a Bach piece. And you're like, how do you describe music for someone who's never um, heard it before? And so that was, it was a challenge and it was interesting. And I was so grateful that I had him because he said, okay, here's, here's like seven different tricks. Let me show you them and pick a couple that you like. And so he helped me figure out about four of them that would, that would work well in a story. So you performed literary magic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was literary magic. And when I was reading that part, you know, I was picturing it in my mind and several of those, the, you know, the tricks in there, I've if either current perform or performed in the past. And so I was kind of picturing and, you know, one of the things too, that in, in the, that scene, it doesn't go into methodology of how she was doing it. It's just, it, it showed, it, it was how the how the people are, are visualizing it but in me in my head I'm thinking well, I wonder if she would use this method or this method or oh, I bet she could do this with you know and uh so your your description of that allowed me to paint a pretty accurate picture in my head um and it was pretty accurate so well Great. done I, again oh thank you that meant a lot <laughs> I got your email saying, yep. Yeah. I'm like, oh, you. Um, and I remember, you know, I mentioned to you once before too, it was interesting about the research of that is figuring out um, what kind of decks were around, you know, during different eras. And you just assume that, oh, they have these, if you do a search for trick decks, you get names. And of course, but then you think, was that around in the 1940s? So I remember thinking that I, like, Svengali's have been around for a long time. So I was thrilled about that. But I remember thinking I, if I couldn't verify it, it didn't go into the story, you know, and and it's interesting how the how the the decks have evolved since then. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're going to talk about uh, we talked about briefly before we got on about bicycle decks. Yes. Um, you know, it was ironic that as the prize you're giving away that bicycle deck, uh, most magicians use bicycle cards. This is you know, this is from the bicycle card bicycle deck. You can see that. And the reason we prefer 
bicycle decks is because of how they're made. They're a good, the cards are a good rigidity. The, their finish make them manipulate well and, and fan well. And they're relatively inexpensive and easy to get in that you can go to a CVS or a Walmart and pick up a brick of decks for like under 10 bucks. And so all of those things are why it's bicycle is a preferred brand of most magicians. That's amazing. And I love that the bicycle decks were really the ones they use for map decks. Mm. So um, I didn't mention it here yet, but I know I've talked to a lot of uh, interviews and stuff and talked about how if you want to see the the one deck that is known to still exist as a map deck, um, it is on display at the Washington, D.C. Uh, Spy Museum, National Spy Museum. And so if you I cannot wait to travel there someday and go see it. I couldn't because it was, it was my COVID book. You know, nobody was traveling anywhere. So I definitely want to go there someday and see it. It's on display, but you can also see it on their website. So if you go um, to the, the, the museum's website, you'll, you'll see an image of it there, which is really cool. And it is bicycle. So I thought that was really neat that I didn't think a bicycle had been around that long. And yes, of course it has. So. Yeah. Uh, bicycle is made by the U S playing card company, which is in, I believe Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, somewhere in Ohio. Yeah. Um, and so they've, they've had many different types of bicycle decks and such, but this is the most common one. This is called their rider back deck because there's, there's two angels riding bicycles, yeah. uh, but they have other decks that they put out as well, but they're, they're still bicycles. They're just different kinds. Yeah. So I thought we'd probably wrap up with one more little quick conversation. Cause this is a fun one is one of the things I learned as I was researching was about um, slang terms in illusions and magic. And I thought something, I knew that some of my favorites, you know, I, that I tried to weave in, I'm like, oh, that's good. I've got to put that in, you know, and some of those, the methods that we talked about, you know, the lapping, the palm, the palming, the dropping, you know, the, um, the sleeving and the fridge drop. And I had to try to thank goodness for YouTube. You know, I got to be able to see people doing them, which is so helpful rather than describing it on paper. Um, and one of the ones that I loved too was uh, how they would call them confederates, which I thought was so interesting when it's a plant, right? When it's a volunteer that they planted in, um, in the audience. I think there were a few other terms for it, if I remember right, but a confederate, that was an interesting choice. And then a committee being the volunteers that they bring up, you know, they'd refer to them as the committee. Um, and I, I think there was, what else? There was a few other ones that I remember that, of course, worked their way into the story, but um, I think we mentioned briefly once before when we touched base about, I never thought about till I read about the slang about how everything is about hurting the audience when you do well. <laughs> so it is about like you slayed it, you killed the audience. <laughs> I thought, oh, yeah, it really is. What's that all about? You know, I'm not sure where where that came from, but and I don't know if that's necessarily just uh, just from magic or it's the performing arts right. as well. I mean, uh, everyone knows the term break a leg which sounds sounds brutal you know but actually it has nothing to do with actually breaking bones it's back in the days of vaudeville if you were uh if you were called to do an act in a vaudeville and whatever but you never made it on stage because your part had to be cut or whatever for time you didn't get paid so if the curtain raised high enough to show your leg you were considered having performed and and would get paid. So when somebody said break a leg, what it meant was I hope the, the curtain shows at least your leg so you get paid tonight. Love it. That is great. I always meant to like look that up. And I'm I thought of that yesterday. I'm like, I gotta look that up and see where that came from. Cause just recently, I think it was like a TikTok video, which of course is not, it's like the Wikipedia of, of life. You you don't, it's fun, but you don't rely on it like as as um as gospel for the truth of history. But it was interesting. I saw a gal recently that talked about what her version of it was was she said, you know where break a leg comes from? She said is that if you go to audition for a part in a play and you, you know, or any kind of show and you, um, and you get in, then you are part, you are in a cast. <laughs> I thought, oh, I like wow. that. That's pretty good. <laughs> so we probably just made it up, but I'm like, that's pretty good. I like that. <laughs> well, I know our time is winding down and we want to give, uh, save a few minutes for audience questions. If anybody has any, you can type them in the Q and a uh, portion of your toolbar, or you can type them in the chat box. But I know that a couple people, um, had mentioned about, uh, movies uh christina Lori had asked and maria had mentioned it about uh movie any any bites on that 
So um, I did sign with my number one dream agency, CAA, um, for this book, and and I've been with them with a one, one or two of my early books, and um, and then but you know had had made some changes through the years, and just depend on what the book fit well. And I'm really excited to say that yes, that Ways We Hide did go with CAA, and I have an agent there who's very excited about it. Um, already has a screenwriter who. Um, loves the story and wants to adapt it. And they also met with my number one. And I, you know, I'm only sharing this much just because we got to throw it into the universe, right? We, we got it. We're going to all will it to happen um, by not just keeping it in. And that is that they met with my number one um, dream production company for this. So, and they were interested as well. So we'll see what happens. Um, 2020 taught us that anything is possible. <laughs> So, yes. so that's where I'm going with it. So we'll see. And if there is some exciting news, you know that I'm going to share it with Susan first and you guys will all hear about it right after that. And then we're going to celebrate with Macon, maple bacon donuts. Always. The Always. only the only way to celebrate. Yes. All right. All right. Well, we'll keep fingers and Maria said legs crossed too. Thank you. And Thank Michelle you. wants to know how you got your first novel published. Oh, how to get my friends. Oh, goodness. So that one, <laughs> you mean, after all the many, many rejections, <laughs> um, like you say, it was an overnight success in two very long years of trying to get an agent. So yeah, the first one was Letters from Home. Um, as Sue knows, I, I was inspired by my grandparents' World War II courtship letters. I was not planning to be a creative writer at all. I was barely a reader. Oh, gosh, I've seen the error of my ways and done a lot of catching up since then. So I just decided I was high on hormones. <laughs> I was give, I was creating life at the time. Um, I was pregnant and I thought if I can make a baby, I can make a book. So it seemed pretty easy and I was ridiculously um, yeah, ignorant. So I learned a lot, uh, wrote a terrible first draft that my mother loved. <laughs> I don't, I don't know that I have a, you know, you have really good friends when they stick by you through that first draft of your very first book and give you compliments. They find things that they can compliment you on. Um, and so that became my first book. I went, got through a lot of rejections and I'll share this because it is very fun to share in hindsight is, and I shared this with, um, with my friends, Jamie Ford, Kristen Hanna, you know, we've all giggled about this Kate Quinn because I have, I still kept all of my rejection letters. I've got 65 or so of them and I'm very proud of them because I would get one rejection and you're pretty bummed <laughs> uh, for about five minutes. And then I would send out two more queries on the same day. So I always had twice as much hope than disappointment. I figured it was just a matter of time that all I needed was one yes. And so in the meantime, I would then keep working on the, on the manuscript and make it the best possible. I didn't just let it sit there. And so that when I was requested to send in a full manuscript, I'd be ready with the best thing that was ready at that point. And that's what happened. And, um, and what's funny about the rejection letters that I shared with Kristen and Jamie is that um, there were a good number of them, especially as my writing, I like to think, got better through the drafts. Uh, that started not just flat out rejecting me of dear author when they don't even put your name on the letter. <laughs> they say, they say uh, the formest of the form letters. When they send back, they used to do snail mail, right? When I did this about 15 years ago. So they would send you back your own. Sometimes I got my own query letter back in the mail and they, they wouldn't even, they wouldn't even spend paper on us. <laughs> like It was a self-addressed stamped envelope and it would come back in the mail and occasionally it would be the letter I sent them and they would write on my letter, not for us. And I'm like, ouch, <laughs> ouch. So, but as the manuscript got better um, and they started saying, thank you, ouch. Yes, thank you, Michelle. Um, feel, my, feel my pain. So they started saying, dear Miss McMorris, you know, so you start getting the personalization before they say no to you. You're like, okay, well, at least now they're reading the story. And they... <laughs> They give a few um, compliments and that was nice. And they say, just not a fit or what have you. But here's what's funny. When the, the book was very close to then what it became when I published it, you know, you know when, it, when I sold it, the letters were full of nice compliments about the characters and the writing and the story, which was wonderful to, to hear. And then they would tell me if they rejected it, it was because unfortunately, World War II novels just don't sell. Um, or they would say, you know, letters, um, books, like novels about letters um, just don't sell. And so then Guernsey came out, you know, and then now can you imagine us saying World War II never sells? <laughs> like, it's it's pretty funny. So that's why I told Jamie and Kristen and said, oh, you guys, I posted it once, one of the letters. I said, 
you might want to just give up on those those books that you know that you think you're doing so well and go try for another genre so what I learned you now over a million copies later mm -hmm, thank you very much <laughs> it 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 does feel nice. That's why I also I keep the rejections. And I will say that what I learned from that is nothing sells until it sells. And I think that is true in so many industries. And, you know, and, and I could have tried to write something that, that everybody was writing and, you know, but I wrote what I was passionate about and what I cared about and a tribute to my grandparents' generation and them. And, and I'm glad that I didn't know any better when I wrote it. Absolutely. And I think we have time for one last question. I know Let's close it out. Brent has a question for Chris. Yeah, Brent, you have a question yeah. for me. Well, as you were talking about the whole thing with the, you know, the movie and everything. So the ways we hide, who would you cast as Fena? Oh, I hope you guys have answers for me. Some of you here listening, you better have answers for me because I'm terrible at that. Um, I will say that I never picture characters. Um their faces as much as I think of them as personalities that I know, just like your closest friends, you don't, you don't really think about their features anymore. You just think about their personality when they walk in the door. So it's hard to describe their eye color or the shape, et cetera. Of course, I have to come up with that for the story. So I put those in, but I never really picture them, um, especially as actors. So when, when CA asked me, who would you, you know, who would you see in this? I had to think, oh my gosh, who, who, who? Well, the only you have to help me out here, guys, because um, the only I came up with a couple and the one that came to mind immediately was Anya Taylor-Joy, who was in the Queen's Gambit. Right. That's the one that I came up to okay. immediately right? as well. Yeah. Yes. Oh, she'd be so brilliant in this story. And it has the orphanage in it, too. I mean, there were just parts of it that I remember watching the show and friends said, have you seen this show yet? This reminds me of your book um, and because the, the book wasn't out yet. So. Yeah. So let's all send that out to her. If anybody knows her here, feel free to give her a call. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Well, great. By question. the way, Christina, I would love to uh, get an invite to the red carpet premiere when, when the movie comes out, you know, so we can. Well, all it's going to have to be an adventure by the book advance. So you yeah. can, you can join us. <laughs> there you go. Absolutely. And yes, Melissa's always really good at coming up with it. She always casts all the books that she, that she reads. Oh, and, love it. Billy Bobby love Brown. It. Yep. I thought yeah, it was in a few years. Yes. I agree with that. All right, so I know our time is, is pretty much run out and we want to do the giveaway, but I did want to thank um, all of our adventurers for attending. You guys are always so uh, supportive and incredible um, literary lovers. Uh, you purchase books, you come to events, you read, um, and you just, you can tell by the chat box how engaged you are with, with um, other readers and we appreciate you so much. Um, Brent and Christina, Brent, it was a pleasure meeting you. If you're in the Chicago area looking for a magician, Brent, your man, Brent Allen, the, Brent, the magician, uh, Christina McMorris, always a pleasure um, with every event. She's just as charming and delightful as she is talented. And I love doing events with her. This has been super fun. Um, and you guys did a great job on Zoom because I know it's a challenge to do that. I'm going to mention one last event and then we'll do the book drawing uh, or the prize drawing is that um, for those of you who have a hard time selecting which books you want to read for the new year 2023 we are having our first ever virtual on zoom free pitch fest with 20 authors from debut authors to new york times and international best-selling authors we're going to do a fun fast-paced pitch fest where they talk to you about their books we're going to send you a cheat sheet so that you can take notes on it and don't even have to write anything down other than your own personal notes uh, if you're with a library, with a book club, with a reading group, or you're just a reader and want to get some ideas, 20 authors all in a like 90 minute Zoom event for free. So hope you uh, go to our website, adventuresbythebook.com to check that out. And last but not least, we want to do the grand drawing. And so um, you do have to be present to win. And we did give an extra drawing to people who purchased books, but everyone's entered in the drawing. And I think the best way to do this is I went through um, the attendees and who's still present. And I just wrote down their names and I'm just going to do a circle with my pen until just like with the card, you say, stop. Who's going to do it? Christina, just say okay. stop and I'll tell you who won. Okay, here we go. I'll go one, two, stop. Uh, Sandy Christensen. Is Sandy oh. still here? If you are, type in say Sandy. so in the chat box, because if you're not here, we're going to draw the next name. Sandy Christensen, are you here? How many of you are like, she's gone, she's gone, she's gone. <laughs> oh, wait, I see her name in the attendees. 
Oh, oh here she is. Here. I'm here. Yay. Okay, Sandy Christensen is the grand winner of the prize. So Sandy, um, just email me or I'll email you and we'll get your information that we can pass along to Christina so she can ship that to you. Um, Again, thank you, everybody. It's been fun. I want to thank Amber behind the scenes, um, who's typing in all those great links and answers to your questions and comments in the chat box and does an amazing job putting these events together. So thank you all. It's been a pleasure. Have a great night and happy holidays. Till the next time. What's your next adventure by the book? Yes. Good night, everybody. Bye, everybody.